All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher. I uh, thought the pandemic was over, but it is not. We are back in the bubble with rematches <laughs> of the East <laughs> and the finals and to break it all down. Let's bring in Drew Dinsick, Vaughn Dalzell, Kurt Elam. Gentlemen, good to see you all. Uh, let's get straight into the Western Conference finals. Lakers at Nuggets. Kurt, I'll start with you. Uh, this market is trending towards Denver. Uh, they are minus 160 favorites to win the series now, five and a half point favorites in game one. Do you think that their pretty solid favorite status is warranted? Yeah, except that the I, I think it really was one of the this is one of those situations where on paper in a bubble, when I'm just looking at it, I'm like, Denver should win this. Like they've been playing better defense. The way their offense is constructed will give the Lakers defense real problems. They don't have a well, nobody has a good answer for Jokic, but his passing to cutters and having actually having shooters everywhere, unlike the Warriors, causes problems. My concern is simply this the Lakers and LeBron James are an organization and a player used to the stage, used to rising to the occasion on the stage, used to being finding a well and reserve of of play. And he did it last series. Like a brilliant game six because they knew they couldn't go up there for game seven. And so he's got 30 points and, and on ridiculous was a 10 of 13 shooting or whatever it was it like, he's going to be good. Is Denver. I mean, I'll ask you guys, is Denver ready for this moment? I would say in the two years since the bubble in the two years of the bubble, what have we seen to make, make us think that, you know, they are ready to take that step forward. I mean, Drew, have you seen anything? Because I don't think so. Lakers at plus one thirty. LeBron ten and one in the conference finals. I mean, my grades other than Yok other than Jokic, my grades on the players on the Nuggets are all a little bit lower <laughs> than with the guys that were in the bubble. So it's tough to say. But you know, my grade on Jokic is quite a lot higher that he was even a couple of years ago. He continues to improve his games in ways that I think is really difficult to quantify. And, uh, you know, the thing that has set the Lakers apart in this particular playoff run, you know, you, know, you can key on, you know, just in general, uh, Anthony Davis's defensive impact, uh, but just the Lakers team defense overall being really well organized, just not making many mistakes. Um, and that's going to be put to the test because so, so far what we've seen this season and really the last couple of seasons, but particularly, uh, you know, in 2023, Jokic is now an offensive player that, you, that defies any matchup. Like there's almost nothing you can do. You have to pick your poison. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be fascinating to see what the Lakers have in response to that, because if their defensive effort is the same level we saw against the Warriors, same level we saw against the the Grizzlies, and they can steal one of these two uh, in Denver to start, with, start off the uh, series, uh, you know, the role players are playing so well at home, uh, and LeBron and, and AD pretty clearly are, uh, you know, a dynamic du duo that, um, you know, together is better than, you know, Jokic plus the next best player for the Nuggets. So uh, it's kind of, in, it's a, it's going to be an interesting matchup, but I agree with the market being, uh, you know, you know, moving in the direction of the Nuggets. The question is, is minus 160 now kind of overstating, uh, you know, that advantage. Uh, Jay, do you have a, a read on this one? Yeah, I love the Nuggets. Love the Nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Uh, to me, the biggest development of the first two rounds of the playoffs in terms of like championship equity is the level that the Nuggets defense has been playing at because I think we knew that they have they have the highest floor of any team on offense on a given possession because you just give the ball to Jokic uh, and then the, like you're just guaranteed to get something relatively good out of that possession when you do that. But the question was always the defense and the fact that they've been able to to operate at a 110 defensive rating the first two rounds, which is basically the best defense in the league during the regular season. Obviously, scoring goes down a bit in the playoffs, but I just think the level that Gordon, uh, the KCP, that MPJ even, uh, that they're playing at defensively, Bruce Brown, I think when you add that to the level that Jokic is playing at on offense, which is about as high as a level as you can get to in the NBA, I think that Denver are the best team in the West. And I think with the Lakers, I think we're going to look back on them as a team that was, look, obviously they played really well, they're exceeding expectations, but I think they're also a product of how limited uh, and underwhelming these Grizzlies and Warriors teams were in particular. The Warriors, uh, they just have, they just had, didn't have it this season. For whatever reason, pool just going down the drain uh, really impacted that team negatively. So I, I think that the, the Nuggets, the way they handled 
the Wolves uh, and the Suns defensively in particular it gives me a fair bit of confidence that they're going to handle the Lakers as well. But uh, you disagree, Vaughn? Yeah, I do disagree. I mean, and I think Kevin Durant and Devin Booker would disagree with Aaron Gordon's defense too for the most part in that series. Because from games three on, I mean, these two were incredible. But I don't know who really guards LeBron to that degree. Like Aaron Gordon looked good at some points, but the indication is that he's going to have a lot of all-around performances. And you mentioned KCP. He's really that role player that can he step up for the Nuggets. He was with the Lakers previously, and he's done pretty well too. But another role player that no one's mentioned is D'Angelo Russell. He's made a big difference for the Lakers this season. And in the postseason, when he scores 15 or more points, they're 7-1. and one. Uh, compared to one and three when he does not. So the Lakers have started out good in series. I mean, they're, they won both their road games against Memphis and Golden State, like you mentioned. Uh, Denver and L.A. are both the only teams left in the playoffs that are undefeated at home. But I think you're looking at a team that's been here before, like Kurt said, and LeBron James, he's been here so often. The Nuggets, to me, those role players you all mentioned, they've been good, but they haven't had a moment where they've gone up against the caliber of players in this moment. I think if this game, this series goes six or seven, it only helps the Lakers in every sense of the word. But best offense versus best defense, uh, I'm taking the team with more you know, veteran leadership and arguably the best player of all time. Oof, man, this Four is a tough money. one. Four this is money. a tough one now. Uh, Jay's, Jay's points were fair, but I got to tell you, Jay, uh, I don't know that I'm buying the Nuggets defense having taken a step no. forward up against the Timberwolves and the Suns. The Sun, you know, both of those – you know, both Rudy those Gobert squads were DJ, pretty DJ, flawed. DeAndre yeah, the there were some, yeah. some, there were some teams, pretty flawed play there. Honestly, both teams played places you could hide guys that don't exist this anymore, right? That was – Denver's got shooters everywhere. There's – like Jay said, there's no Jordan Poole. There's no Clay Thompson who was awful the last three games of that series. Uh, they – Go ahead and leave KCP and Bruce Brown and see what happens. And the other thing that I think Denver's offense can really click on is remember when they had, they start Gary Payton in, in game four and Davis is now on green and he's got to come out to the, to the level of the ball of the pick and roll. And they back cut them to death for the first half and until they switch Davis onto Wiggins, but you're not going to be able to do that against the Nuggets, and they will back cut them to death. They love that back cut. They love those cuts to the rim with Jokic passing and guys moving. I think their offense is going to click. I think the other thing, guys, I'm really curious about with this, neither both teams are going to have to find a way to stop dribble penetration. The Lakers really haven't been great at it all season, even after the All-Star break. They, they can't let this be a Jamal Murray series, right? Like, they can't let him get rolling downhill like that. Yeah. I think there's a couple other things, too, where – one, the Lakers, like they're just forced to play a range of fairly limited players, either on offense or defense, like guys like Rui, like Vanderbilt, like D'Angelo Russell, he's going to have to be on the floor and they're going to have to deal with his defensive shortcomings. They don't really have a backup center at all. Like they're giving Wendy and Gabriel minutes sometimes, sometimes they're not. I think that's going to be an issue and it will be exploited by Denver. I think the fact that people have talked about you know, Phoenix, they were a team that had no real continuity, that hadn't really played together. This Lakers team was cobbled together in February, effectively. And I think that may rear its head uh, against a Denver team that is playing with more continuity than anyone, I think. And they're just, they have so much connectivity on offense and that spread um, to defense now as well. So, uh, and also the last thing is, is that the Lakers completely no-showed games two and five in both series and then also really struggled in games four of both series. And I just worry that LeBron and AD with what they've dealt with health-wise, I think that they're just fatigue is going to be more of an element for them. There are no extended breaks in the conference finals. Every game is every other day. I think that favors Denver as well. So uh, yeah, look, I may be wrong. Uh, LeBron and AD are obviously pretty terrifying, but I think Anthony Davis is going to have to be the best player in this series for the Lakers to win. And uh, I'm going to ride with Nikola Jokic. But, I mean, uh, depending on which games you've watched these playoffs, LeBron, I mean, yeah, Anthony Davis has yeah. been the best player in the playoffs so far. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just Jimmy a matter Butler of... would like a word with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, he, I mean, yeah, his series against the Bucks his was an all-timer series. for sure. But, um, you know, I think, I, I, and, you know, all of the points we're kind of making here tend to, you know, make me relook at this two, 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 two and a half, two twenty two and a half uh, total for game one as potentially too low. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I think, 
yes, the Lakers don't necessarily want to win and attract me, but we've seen them kind of come out now two series in a row and just really put on the afterburners, you know, kick up the pace, play into pace, I think, in game one against uh, both the Grizzlies and the uh, uh, the Warriors. So I, you know, I could definitely see this series starting out as a, a little bit of a track meet. And again, like for – you know, I've 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 lived through enough uh, doubting LeBron with a, a team that is you know not up to the you know level of their competition just to see them you know ultimately win in advance uh, so many times now. This isn't even the most impressive run you can kind of point to, or even maybe like top three. Uh, maybe it's his fourth or fifth most impressive run because he does have Anthony Davis with him. But um, you know, this is. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm starting to get the same kind of feeling in the pit of my stomach, like, uh, uh oh, uh, the Laker, you know, LeBron's doing it again, and uh, you know, to the degree that uh, Denver does have defensive deficiencies, I think that might open the door for these guys. Yep. Do the well, Lakers have to steal one of the first two? I think yes. absolutely. I think so. I think they steal game one. Well, I think I, uh, I think Jeff Green rushing. doesn't play enough defense in the post for the Nuggets, and uh, Lakers score a ton. Because that's their mm-hmm. backup center, Jay, is Jeff Green right now. Yeah, I that's love scary. Jeff Green. Uh, Jeff Green. <laughs> kind of um, I think that yeah, the Lakers are a really good team to live bet against because you can kind of just tell in the first five, ten sure. minutes whether they're there or not. Um, in game five against the Warriors, even though they hung around, it's pretty clear from the start their transition defense just wasn't there. LeBron is settling for jumpers. There are a lot of telltale signs to – Potentially bet the other side, but uh, but yeah, we'll see. Uh, like they're on opposite sides. Uh, before we get into Boston, Miami, a reminder to download the Roto World app to receive breaking player news all season long. Stay ahead of the competition by favoriting players on your roster. Get the latest injury updates, player news, and much more delivered right to your phone. It's available in the App Store today. Now, where I want to start with this is that. With four and a half minutes left in game six of Boston, Philadelphia, Sixers are up two. Tyrese Maxey missed the three. Next possession they have, they have another chance to extend the lead to five. James Harden misses a step back three. At that point, the Sixers were minus 155 to win the Eastern Conference, not just win the game, win the series, to win the Eastern Conference. And Jason Tatum was on track for possibly the the worst game that a good player has played in the playoffs since, I don't know, one of the LeBron Dallas finals games in 2011, uh, one of the James Harden closeout games, of which there are many. So it changes pretty quickly. And now the Celtics, all of a sudden, off of Tatum's 51, they are in the Eastern Conference Finals. They play Miami there for the third time in four years. Kurt, this one, the market thinks is fairly done and dusted. The Celtics are minus 500 favorites. Uh, do you think that Miami has a prayer in this one? First off, uh, Daryl Morey would like to thank you for making his case for firing Doc Rivers. Yeah. Um, Jay. <laughs> right. um, yeah, I kind of think so. I, 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 I wonder how long this will go because we've all talked about this. Talk about the team that doesn't show up for games. It's the Celtics. Yeah. Like they just mail some in and you, the heat will bring it every night. They will play hard. But I think this is the series where not having the secondary shot creation of Tyler hero really hurts them. Mm-hmm. They just, they have, I mean, Jimmy Butler's going to do Jimmy Butler things, but I think with Brown, with Tatum, with the, with smart, with the wealth of defenders they can throw at Butler, you can slow him down. Bam's going to have a good game here and there. They'll get a good Struce game and shout out to my boy, Gabe Vincent, go UC Santa Barbara Gauchos. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, I just don't believe in them doing it enough against the Celtics, but I still think this will probably go something like six just because Boston will mail two in. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to say coaching advantage pretty clearly in favor of the Heat here. Um, yeah. Joe Missoula didn't really do anything, in my opinion, to get the Celtics across the line other than just kind of let Tatum cook in uh, game seven there. And honestly, the fact that Doc Rivers did not have an answer for the Tatum pick and roll, even through seven games in that series, I thought for sure they would have had some adjustments, some wrinkle, some, you know, make some change at halftime, guys. What are we doing here? And then just to see it unfold that way in the third quarter was wild yesterday. So, but the Celtics are a tough handicap because, as you mentioned, not only do they 
they have some coaching in, you know, in the you know, deficiencies, but uh, they do have some effort lapses at times. And, you know, you put these teams on paper side by side and you compare talent in terms of who's available. And it's just an overwhelming advantage Celtics. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, minus 500 seems a little bit aggressive to giving them uh, that type of, um, you know, expectation in this series. This is now effectively the rubber match of an Eastern Conference Finals. We had Heat Celtics in the bubble went to the Heat. Heat Celtics last year went to the Celtics. Um, Vaughn, how do you look at this uh, in terms of kind of matchup of coaching and player strength and just familiarity between these two teams and come away with uh, a handicap? Missoula is definitely going to have to keep his po- his timeouts in his pockets. Uh, psych. He needs to start using his timeouts. <laughs> uh, you know, that was an issue for me in the last round. I definitely thought, you know, the uh, inexperience, I guess, or the freshness of him being there for the first season came into play. But I've also noticed that Boston in game ones have been very lackluster and they get in track meets. And sometimes they don't take their opponent as serious in that first half, let them hang around and that shooting continues. But Miami's a team you can't let that happen because Miami's 5-0 and in their last five game ones. They've won two straight road game ones. Boston's 1-4 and in their last five game ones outside of the first round. So they really struggle and they've been favorites every situation. I know Jimmy Butler didn't score 30 points at all in that last series against the Knicks, but he still averages 31 in the postseason. Kudos to his that first series, like Drew mentioned. But with no value on the, the Celtics right now series price, I do like the Heat in game one. I think the Heat can still two of the first three or two of the first four. If the Heat go up 2-1 the series, absolutely going back on the Celtics price because uh, as we kind of talked about in that Nuggets-Lakers series, I think the Celtics have a significant advantage with the big man compared to the Heat, when you're looking at Kevin Love, uh, Zeller, Highsmith, those type of guys, you definitely want to favor Rob Williams, Al Horford, and the rest of the Celtics. But uh, I do think the Heat can shoot. Uh, a lot of money coming in on the over here. I think that's warranted as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, I like the Heat in game one for sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm on the Celtics. I love the Celtics in the series. <laughs> love them in game one. I think a friend and I are already looking at uh, game five uh, travel plans for Celtics Nuggets. Uh, it's June 12th. Already teeing that one up in Boston. I think that the Celtics... <laughs> <laughs> I think the issue with the Heat is that they've largely been inflated by... Look, Miami, they get a lot better if they can play Kevin Love and Duncan Robinson uh, mm-hmm. and get away with Highsmith and Zella having those guys on the floor. And I think that the fact that they were able to do that against two teams in Milwaukee and New York, who don't really have guys who kind of hunt a Kevin Love on a switch. Jalen Brunson, he more beats you with strength than with guile. It's not like guys like Tatum and Brown who just hunt your worst defender. They hunt Tyrese Maxey. Uh, they hunt George Niang. Whoever is there, they're going to punish them every possession. And so I think the Heat have been a bit inflated by the fact that those guys were playable. And then also I think they were inflated by the fact that they just shot 45% from three against Milwaukee and Jimmy Butler was the best player on planet Earth. He is now, by Eric Spolster's own admission, he's still dealing with the ankle and he didn't look the same guy that he was uh, in the first series um, against the Knicks. So I think that the Celtics, yes, they're going to play with their food. They're probably going to drop one. They might drop two, <laughs> but still, you just think that the talent gap here uh, is just so substantial. Um, Kurt, there is a line of thinking that, you know, the Heat, Last year, they were a one seed. They were one shot away. They were Jimmy Butler three from making the finals and beating this team. And there is a thought that maybe you have to regress this Heat team back to just the team that they were last year, where they were a one seed. Do you think that this team this year is substantially worse than last year's version? First off, thank you for getting to play with your food right and not doing a Doc Rivers there. Um, (laughs) They... I, I don't think they're quite as good offensively. Uh, Bam has – I want to give Bam credit for – look, he didn't have that floater two years ago, that little 12-foot yep. floater that he developed basically to shit over Brooke Lopez. But he, he developed it. it. It is a valuable weapon now. He's, you get him 14 feet out, and he will just nail it every time. I think that, though, they just had – look, they missed P.J. Tucker and, and the – the things PJ Tucker brings, um, which we saw even in the first, you know, first quarter of, of game se- of game seven, um, they like I said, they really miss Tyler here. They just don't have the depth of shot creation. I think that when you we talked about it with the Lakers and Nuggets, one of the things that really works for those teams is so many guys can create if, if on both teams. It's not just I mean, yes, they Nuggets run everything through Jokic, but MPJ and. Jamal Murray and even Bruce Brown can do a little creation. The Lakers are loaded with it. 
They just don't have that there. They uh, they rely on Gabe Vincent to be the secondary shot creator, and I think that that's not enough against Boston. And I think it's just a step. I don't think they're as good as last year's team. They're they fight like heck, but they don't. I just don't think that depth of talent is there. Yep. What do you think, Troy? Who the show series? I mean, I'm in the same boat here as uh, sort of our last breakdown, which is I i just don't see any realistic matchup that the Heat have an advantage in outside of coaching. And yet at the same time, I'm struggling making sense of this price. Like minus 500 for the Celtics is basically saying this is, you know, not no contest. And, uh, you know, the Heat, for whatever reason, have, uh, you know, have the intangibles over a Celtics team that, uh, you know, maybe, you know, it it doesn't serve the Celtics well, I don't think, to be such huge favorites, right? They need a little bit of like uh, adversity. It feels like to bring out right. the best of these guys. And you know, I mean, if they if the Heat uh, steal one in these first couple of games, then all of a sudden the pressure is going to be on the Celtics, and maybe we see their best. But uh, you know, just at the start here, and you know, just thinking about the way that uh, you know Spolstra can. Uh, you know, you know, pull some wizardry into the series. It it has me a little trepidatious about getting super involved in the Celtics until we know exactly what level of effort we're going to get from these guys. Are they a good team to live bet, Jay? Are they one of those teams where you can tell whether they're great? <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, it's a good idea, and then I thought of Game Six. I'm like, yeah, maybe not. Well, here's so here's here's the funny thing about the Celtics. Like, I was uh, perfectly happy being on the Celtics in Game Six once we got the word that uh, Robert Williams was going to be in the starting lineup. Like, that was an adjustment that was mm-hmm. so long overdue, and most of the. Uh, you know, most of yes. the uh, reporting on that was it wasn't even Missoula, Missoula's call. Like no, somebody else basically not. said, hey, you need to do this. And like, yeah, OK, well, now you have your best defensive lineup out there. It's going to finally kind of t- tilt the balance at least a little bit in your favor if your stars can find their offense. And they finally did. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's concerning that uh, you have that level of disparity coaching wise, in my opinion. It is concerning, but at the same time, I just think the talent is going to overwhelm that where if Spolster is coaching the four of us and producer Adam <laughs> against the Celtics, it's not really going to matter that much. I think that to your question, Kurt, the Celtics, I think they're a little bit of a different case because they tend to flip the switch just within games where yeah. they go from just looking just completely gone and then all of a sudden they just wake up. Uh, and so the thing is with the Celtics, like it feels like they no-show a lot of games, but I wonder how much of that is just that they take a lot of threes and when the threes don't fall, they just look terrible yeah, yeah. because a lot of their team is is Tatum hitting that step back three to his right because if that's going in at 25% like it was in the finals last year, then it's just not a very good offense um, relative to, to what it can be. But if he is making those shots like he was yesterday, then they're just completely unbeatable. So uh, mm-hmm. let's close out quickly with just some quick predictions. I'm going to go... I think both of these series are done in five. I'm going Nuggets in five, Celtics in five. Vaughn, what do you got? I'm going Lakers in six, and I'm going Celtics in six. All right, Drew. Man, Nuggets in Nuggets in seven, Celtics in seven. I think we're going to be. I think we're in for two long series here. I don't think either of these is a pushover. Okay, and Kurt, what do you got? Um, Nuggets in seven, and. Quietly, since I'm tra- traveling with the finals, I'll be quietly rooting for Miami because <laughs> God, I would love to spend some time in Miami. Um, I'll still, I'll, I will still take – I'll take the Celtics in five. I just – I think they're going to overwhelm them. Hey, Boston, Boston is wonderful in June, Kurt. Absolutely wonderful. Boston is wonderful. Yeah, I was there That's last a good year. point, actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll close out there. Kurt, can you tell people uh, where to find you on social media and uh, what you'll be working on during the conference finals? Lots of conference finals. Uh, Vaughn helped me today with uh, five things to watch in the Western Conference Finals. We'll have Eastern up tomorrow, uh, breakdowns of the games. Um, and uh, there's a little draft thing, lottery thing that can like, <laughs> yeah. swing the next decade tomorrow night. Yeah. So well, we'll be all over that as well. You can find it every all the stuff at uh, NBCSports.com slash NBA, the NBA page at NBC Sports. And you can find me, uh, as it says below, at Basketball Talk on Twitter. It's usually the best spot to find me. Awesome. Thanks very much for your time, Kurt. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Cool. All right, gentlemen, last thoughts. Any best bets from this? I'll kick us off. I bet Nuggets minus 135 series at open. I think you can still get 
close to that price. Some spots, it has been bet to minus 160 some places. Uh, also bet Nuggets 4-1 at plus 440. And then uh, I bet the Celtics sweep at, uh, at plus 430. Uh, and I still think that there is some meat on the bone with these MVP prices, both finals MVP and the conference ones, where I think that in an event where the Nuggets win a series, that Jokic is like a 98% chance to win MVP. Uh, and that when the Celtics win a series, the market is saying that Tatum is like a 70 to 75% chance. I think he's closer to a 95% chance. Think yeah. about his series against Philly. Take out game seven, which obviously clinches it for him. But uh, think about before heading into that game, if you look at his stats versus Brown, Tatum was having like as bad of a series as he could have offensively. And Jalen Brown was incredibly efficient. And Tatum still wins MVP in a walk yeah. when you look at their stats side by side. So I think those are the best ways to bet these series is just bet on Tatum MVP or Jokic MVP. But uh, Vaughn, what are your best bets? Uh, I completely with you. I agree with you 100% with the Tatum angle because uh, in, he's been filling up the stat sheet, rebounds, assists too, especially when he's been struggling in the first half of games. He's still been coming up big in the second half scoring and continue with the rebounding and passing and not the worst defense. So I think Tatum is a clear edge. I'd want to bet Jalen Brown because I love JB, but falling between 20 and 25 points every single night is really not going to win you that. I think there's value on Anthony Davis, though, if you like the Lakers long term. I think finals MVP tickets. Now, I like the Celtics versus the Lakers, like I said. But I think um, Anthony Davis's defense, have we talked about briefly, has been incredible. And that finals last time he's played, he averaged almost four combined blocks and steals. He's pretty much on that level again with 25 points and 10 rebounds per game. So, And you, we've heard LeBron kind of talk about how much he loves AD. He's going to be in the Raptors Hall of Famer. AD doesn't have a finals MVP, a regular season MVP. None of that stuff to his name yet, uh, but he did have that back in college. So I'm looking at AD prices too, and I did bet the Celtics in uh, six at plus 360. I think betting the Celtics to win in five or six games is a much better price, obviously, than laying minus 525. Uh, but maybe I'm in the minority there. So those are my probably best bets right now. All right, Troy, what do you got? Uh, I got to tell you guys, uh, round two of the NBA playoffs was about as – a dream run as I've ever had betting NBA playoffs. Let's so go. I'm I'm not and usually after kind of firing, firing, firing and having just everything go correctly, uh I'm over brimming with confidence. Oh plus boom 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 boom. No, I, I just I don't see a ton on the board that really is screaming at me for these conference finals. And I am on in the back of my head like the familiarity between Heat Celtics scares me. The familiarity combined with the fact that you have coaching advantage on the team that's the you know the least talented is 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 concerning. And then, uh, yeah, the, you know everything we brought up already about the uh, Nuggets and the Lakers. I I just I don't see either of these being a walk. What you know being a, a, a you know a, a relatively easy contest. And for those reasons, you know we're gonna get it, weird stuff's gonna happen where you know Jared Vanderbilt swings the Lakers Nuggets series or for some reason or uh, you know randomly uh you know the the uh hero probably comes back at some point right like it's, i think I he would ask you that i think game realistically six, game seven? I, I mean i've heard when he first got hurt i heard you know the rumors were late may if they make the eastern conference finals he was going to be back i think people were expecting him to potentially uh you know be, be part of practice he may he may even be questionable for games one or game two i don't know um, but whatever the case is, there's going to be some funny stuff that swings these series, and I just don't have a strong read on it. I agree wholeheartedly that if uh, the Celtics win, Jason Tatum is going to be your, uh, what is it, the Larry Bird Trophy winner uh, or whatever. And then, uh, yeah, if the uh, if the Nuggets win, it's clearly going to be Jokic because of his offensive contribution. So um, those I completely agree with. If you like those two teams, then uh, finding ways into those markets is a better bet than betting the series. Um, but I think we're in for some long series, and I like uh, overs in these early games. Uh, and then uh, we'll just go back exactly. to the well and play unders games five, six, and seven. Okay, yeah. there you go. All right, we are done. Don't forget to check out NBCSportsEdge.com. Thank you to Kurt Heelan for joining us. Thanks to you, Drew, and Vaughn as well. We'll be back tomorrow. Cheers.